So then, welcome back after my short vacation um, to our next lecture here in the Reinforcement Learning course. Today, we're going to continue on deep reinforcement learning based on function approximation, so based on machine learning. And we're going to do our simple task today first, which is on policy prediction. So basically, what Wilhelm introduced shortly last week in the sense of a wrap up on supervised machine learning, we are going today apply to reinforcement learning problems, uh, in particular on the prediction problem. So if you have a certain policy, we want to evaluate giving some data of this policy applied to some control plant, uh, how good or how bad this policy is with respect to the value function. In order to do so, we will um, assume some things. First of all, we will assume that the state space, here represented by the small x, is a continuous state space now, so that's different from what we have considered in the tabular methods. So that means that all our states can have any real numbers, right? So therefore we have an infinitely large state space and um, potentially we have also more than one state which is represented here by this vector. However, for the sake of simplicity, in order to get started with the problem uh, here of continuous um, state spaces, we will still stick to a discrete um, finite action space, um, which is not so important for today because we are not going to discuss so much about actions, but for next week this will be particularly important. Um, and then in two weeks from now, we are going to also make this action space continuous in order to make it, let's say, more complex. But for now, we consider continuous states and discrete actions. Moreover, what we're going to assume is that um, any cost function or any kind of uh, reward function later on, which we will consider um, for... Uh, not the reward function, but cost functions in general, which we are going to optimize in the context of pred prediction and control, that these are differentiable. So therefore we introduce a gradient. I hope everyone, of course, knows the gradient symbol, and we will make use of these gradients a lot. So we assume that any kind of function, which we use for function approximation, is definitely a differentiable function, and therefore we can calculate its first and potentially also second order um, the gradient and the Hessian. Um, the focus of this and the next lecture is then to basically transfer everything which we have seen so far in the first seven lectures on discrete uh, state and action spaces, so from tabular reinforcement learning to deep reinforcement learning using continuous state spaces and then also action spaces later on. And we do this today at least for on-policy methods. On-policy because as we will see later, this is um, very easy in that sense that we can transfer the methods which we have learned via Monte Carlo learning and temporal difference learning really easily, directly, one-to-one. -one. If we would do this off policy, some things would become more complex, at least in the context of prediction. But therefore, today and partly also next week, we will stick only to on-policy methods. And last but not least, if you're interested in off-policy approaches, then we again refer here to the lecture book which we're using, Sutton and Bartow, in particular chapter 11. That would be basically the extension from what we do today to off-policy approaches. However, this will be not relevant for examination. The table of contents for today is then that we basically will discuss first on a very general level the impacts, the general impacts of function approximation to reinforcement learning. What is different, what is similar, to the tabular methods which we have learned so far. Then we will learn about gradient-based prediction, so how do we use function approximation and learning based on gradients. And then we will learn about batch learning, so if we have a given amount of data, fixed amount of data set, how can we use this fixed amount of data set in order to learn how to predict value function from this data as efficient as possible. But first start with the general implications what will result from function approximation applied to reinforcement learning. The first big issue, or the first big potential issue I would like to raise here is that um, Wilhelm last week hopefully emphasized that, is that if you have a classical supervised machine learning approach where you say, okay, we have like some, some data and we want to do like a regression kind of problem, so we take this data in order to explain 
some behavior of a system using a model, then normally the assumption for supervised machine learning is that the underlying process from which we have obtained this data is static and that the data is uh, identically and independently distributed. So basically that you have a well-distributed data set which is fixed, which describes the system which you want to model very holistically and also that nothing changes over time. However, if we consider what we have learned about reinforcement learning, we can basically find, especially when we do control, so when we do policy changes over time, that these two standard assumptions of supervised machine learning do not really hold for most of our reinforcement learning problems. Because if our policy using GPI, so the Generalized Policy Iteration Scheme, changes over time, the data which is generated in terms of state actions and rewards basically is drawn from a dynamic process, right? So our policy is changing, so therefore the entire system from which we get the data, so the agent plus the, the plant system which we're interacting with is changing over time, and therefore the, um, the static property definitely here of the process is not given, and also potentially depending on how our policy, especially if we have an on-policy approach, um, is moving through the state and action space, maybe also our data is not independently and identically distributed. So therefore, in reinforcement learning, at least in standard reinforcement learning, these two assumptions of supervised machine learning norm normally do not hold. And therefore, when it comes to deep reinforcement learning, we potentially maybe run into numerical issues when applying these function approximation techniques to reinforcement learning problems. Okay, what is our task for today? The task for today is basically just uh, summarized here completely in equation 9.1 and we will basically discuss different variants on how to solve this problem here today. Mm -hmm. But our task is basically how can we find a function v hat, so for the state value, which is a good approximation of the true state value given a policy pi. And of course the hat here denotes that this is an estimate and the argument of this function is twofold. The second argument here, the parameter vector w, that is the parameter vector of the function approximator which we use. So that could be, for example, the weights of an artificial neural network, or if we have a linear uh, approximator, just the linear weights of a linear function. So these w's are basically the parameter vector, and they describe the function. So for example, an artificial neural network. Second, or first argument here, which we have called x tilde, that is our feature vector. The feature vector is normally some function of the states, uh, f of x, um, and we describe this feature vector as a mapping of the states plus additional processing of the state information. So if you, for example, know that um, some states are combined with each other or that there you maybe have some pre-knowledge about the system, then you can use feature engineering, so additional mathematical manipulations of the states in order to add additional information to this feature vector x tilde and then use x tilde for this function approximation. We will see such function approximation already um, at least next week in the exercise, a classical uh, feature engineering would be, for example, applying radial basis functions or any kind of lifting functions which tries to enrich the state space. Anyhow, this is just an optional but very common intermediate step. If you apply this here, so basically we still see that this function approximation of the state value function is a function of the states and some parameter vector w. However, typically we see that the state space or the parameter space, which we have called here as zeta, so the, the number of parameters of our function approximator is zeta, that this space is normally much smaller than the state space because otherwise, of course, approximation wouldn't make much sense because our state space needs to be greater than our parameter space in order to gain something from a numerical point of view. Therefore, the uh, problem, as I said, is uh, 9.1. And if you consider 9.1 as our general approximation problem, then um, another interesting issue already occurs, which we will see also later in an example, and that's the so-called generalization example. 
Um, for the generalization example, maybe we can go a step back if I find some chalk somewhere. So, in the previous lectures where we had tabular methods, let's say we had um, some v hat with states x1, x2, x3. Then in a tabular method, what would basically uh, happen is that the state value, let's say 1.1, 1.3 and 1.7, that if we visit the state x3 in a discrete tabular reinforcement learning problem, that only this state value estimate would be adapted, right? So using Monte Carlo learning or temporal difference learning, if you get some data sample, when visiting state x3, this will basically just change this value why are the state value estimates of the first two states are untouched, right? So that's the idea of a tabular method. We just change the table value of the state which we visit. That is good because if we have data which is associated with state number three, there will be at least no direct consequences for the other states which have been not visited so far. In the context of function approximation, we now have basically a function which tries to approximate the state space and therefore if we have a function which tries to approximate the entire state space, we will not only change the state value of state number three, but also the state value of the other two states. So therefore, generalization can become a problem in that sense that if our function, which we plug in here, is not a good function in terms of the topology, then things might get complicated. So consider, for example, a one-dimensional problem. Let's say that's a state x and that's v of pi. And let's say the true state value function is maybe just like a convex kind of function, like the true states. And now by topology, maybe you have considered approximating v pi by v hat as a linear function. So in that sense, we will see that our function approximator with arguments w will be by principle not able to fit the real state value function because here we have a quadratic function and we approximate it with a linear function. So there will be systematic errors between the true state value and the approximated ones. Also, let's say you get a data sample um, here. So we visit the state x at this position. So what we will happen, what we will see is basically this error between the sampled true state value and the estimated one. And if we do a update, basically, what will happen is, of course, that this will be shifted after the update, maybe in this direction. So that would be k0, k1. So that although we have sampled at k0 the state only here, that also the state estimates of all other state values will change, right? So therefore, we have this generalization and it can happen that one update of the state value function can also positively, but also potentially negatively affect all other state value functions for the other states. So therefore, this function approximation is somehow an interesting potential but also occurs in that sense that I have to be really uh, cautious in that sense that the function topology must fit to my actual problem. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that I have to be cautious when I update the state value estimate such that I update it not only for the state value or for the state which I have visited it currently but that I will also interfere with the state value estimates of the other parts of the state space. 
So this is basically a very big difference now to this tabular approach which we have considered so far, where we will only update a state value at a time. Okay, what else needs to be considered? Um, in the tabular case, when we updated a single state value, the cost function or the objective of this update was quite clear. We want to update a single state value estimate such that it becomes closer to the real one. In this generalization scheme where a single state visit will change the entire estimate of the entire state space, this does not hold anymore, so simple. And what we need to do is we need to introduce basically a new prediction error or a new cost function in that sense, how we want to do our state value updates. And in a very general sense, we can introduce this mean squared value error or just called shortly VE for value error, which is basically now a generalization what we have seen previously in the tabular case. We want to minimize the squared error between the estimate and the true state value function weighted over the state space. So mu, function mu of x is here basically a state uh, distribution weight, which will basically uh, depend on if it's on policy or off policy, and we integrate this error over the entire state space, right? So this basically tells us that we will not try to optimize the state value function just for single states which we have visited, but over the entire state space. So we want to find something like the best function fit over the entire operating domain of a certain system which we are interacting with. However, of course, v pi, so the true state value function, of course, is not normally given beforehand, right? Because uh, this is part of the reinforcement learning prediction problem. Nobody gives you the true data v pi. So in supervised machine learning, that would be basically the, the given data points which we already have and we can just do like a simple functional fitting. But in this case, vpi is uh, a priori unknown. And what we will see is again today is that for vpi, we will just do the classical approaches like Monte Carlo samples or bootstrapping using temporal difference learning such that we can basically approximate vpi again based on data samples with respect to reward states and so on. Okay. Good. However, this function 9.2, our cost function, the mean squared value error is, uh, of course, a little bit cumbersome. This would potentially include some multidimensional uh, integral over the entire state space, depending on how many dimensions our state space has. And now in the on-policy case, we can simplify this function, luckily. Uh, in the on-policy case, the weight distribution mu can be just considered the relative visiting, the relative weighting of how often we have visited certain states under the policy pi. So in that sense, we can basically approximate this um, value error or mean squared value error by a cost function which is just a quadratic, standard quadratic error between the true state value function and the approximated state value function in that sense that we say, okay, however, how often we uh, visit a certain state x, that is just given on the on-policy case and we do not need to do some weighting because if certain states are visited more often under a certain policy, then it seems that these states are more important for the policy than other states, so that's fine. That will be basically indirectly weighted in, that case, in this case that the states are just uh, occurring more often in this sum. And of course, this standard quadratic cost function um, can be optimized very nicely as soon as we plug in uh, any Monte Carlo target or TD target for this true state value function. Yeah. If we have this Monte Carlo target, why are we trying to estimate it with the function of approximator then? Yeah, because the Monte Carlo target, of course, only will consider certain parts of the state space, right? So you would get basically, if that is a state space with one dimension, you would start, let's say, for the Monte Carlo target here, and then you would just get the Monte Carlo target for this one state, state value in the sense of this value of the state, right? 
right? You of course want to update for the entire state space, right? And because you know you could you could ask for any state value in the state space for infinitely many changes, right? Because this is now a continuous quantity, so that's why you want to use function approximation that you can basically ask the state value function for any state, what is your value, which in the tabular case would be sufficient to save that in a table because we have a discrete number, a finite number of states, but now we have infinitely many small changes which are possible between the states because these are no real numbers, right? So that's why we need function approximation, although we are using Monte Carlo targets and TD targets later on. Yeah, but good question. Yeah, uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. I've already mentioned that on the previous slide. This is more or less for your uh, convenience. Okay, so let's summarize what we're going to do today. So uh, basically, target is we want to find a parameter vector w from our function approximation, which will minimize our cost function so the value error over the entire state space using on-policy learning. And the challenges are as fo follows. First challenge is that the function approximator requires a certain form to fit the true state value function. So this has been sketched here on this little uh, figure. And second challenge I would like to introduce now, and that is the challenge of, um, let's say, optimization complexity. Um, on the previous slide, we have said, okay, our cost function, j of x and y, is basically just the square sum of v pi of x minus v hat of x comma w squared. So we have a quadratic cost function. And now the question is, how does this function our function approximator looks like. The very simple and I've called it here the nice case is, is that v hat is a linear function. So linear function means v hat x w is some parameter vector w transpose times x, right? Linear mapping some constant parameter vector w, w1 to w, I think I called it zeta, times our state vector x1 to xn, right? If I multiply this row vector with this column vector, I get a scalar estimate for my v hat. That is a linear function. And if I plug in a linear function and a quadratic cost function, then this cost function becomes quadratically dependent on the unknowns w, right? So therefore, I have still a quadratic cost function with respect to the unknown w's, and a quadratic cost function without any constraints is solvable in a closed form way. We will discuss this later on in the batch learning kind of subsection, but basically, this is a simple case because we have, yeah, basically a, a global optimum which I can find by least squares methods. So that's a simple case, a nice case because I can find the best possible parameter vector w by closed form methods. Yes. So just uh, make sure I understood correctly. The linear means it's linear in w. Right? Linear in w. Yeah, it's, double, it's also linear in x, right? But could it also be quadrat quadratic in x and then the cost function would still be linear in w? Yes, yes. So that's a good point. So to be precise, so this is actually our feature vector, right? So here in between, we could have any um, nonlinear mapping between the states and the feature vector x till d. So that would be f of x. Uh, the important thing is that indeed w must be a linear set of parameters which are linearly mapped with respect to the feature vector. So I can have some nonlinearity, but this nonlinearity must, must be completely within the feature engineering, right? 
So the important thing, good question, is that is that W needs to be the linear part here of this equation. Right? Because this is the unknown here in our cost function, x, of course, our states, or x tilde. These are the data points which we have in our database, and W is the unknown parameter vector. Okay. The ugly case, that would be the nonlinear case, where v of x tilde w is just some nonlinear function. Let's call it maybe g x tilde w, where the w's go nonlinearly into this equation. And if there is some nonlinearity here, and I plug in this nonlinearity in my quadratic cost function, there will be a, a nonlinear dependence between the unknown w and my cost function j. In this case, so let's say that's the scalar w and that's the cost function j. Maybe this looks, looks then like something like this. So a, a very ugly landscape with multiple local minima. So depending on where I start my search for an optimal uh, parameter value, maybe let's say I start here, then of course using gradient descent I will basically go out here and find just a local minimum which is not as good as the actual global minimum of the cost function, right? So therefore if I have any nonlinear function, in particular nonlinear artificial neural networks, which could be here plugged in as a function approximator, then I will always run into this global versus local optimization problem. Potentially also, uh, if I have a bad solver or a really bad function, I might also find out that this diverges over time, but at least I have a problem between global and local optimization. And this is really a, a big point which needs to be mentioned here or which I would like to emphasize, that if you use any kind of nonlinear function approximator here, that there is no guarantee Nobody can give you the guarantee that if you, attire, if you apply function approximation, prediction, to this function approximator here of the state value, or later on also for the action value, that this will deliver an accurate global optimum of your parameter vector. Right? So nonlinear optimization, especially in high dimensional spaces, so if the parameter space X has many dimensions, Nobody can give you a guarantee that you will find the global optimum because that is basically an um, unsolved challenge of applied mathematics. Nonlinear optimization, if you do not have infinite computing time and can basically just do an exhaustive search in the entire problem space, you will not be able to find any guarantee that you will find the global optimum of your parameter vector w. And that is something which we definitely should also keep in mind already for next week, where we will also discuss then the control based on deep reinforcement learning, is that if my state value function trying to map the true state values is not accurate, because my nonlinear model of the state value function is not accurate due to the nonlinear optimization problem, then of course this will also have some impact on the learning of optimal control and decision-making techniques, right? If I'm not able to map the state value of certain actions correctly, then I will maybe also learn wrong actions in the future, right? Because function approximation can lead to errors, and these function approximation errors can then lead to wrong evaluations of the usefulness or non-usefulness of certain actions. This was not the case in the tabular case, because in the tabular case, we could prove that uh, with enough iterations, we will be always able to find the exact state value of a certain state, or the exact state action value of a certain state action combination. And with this knowledge, using the policy improvement theory, we could find optimal decisions. Now, in the continuous state spaces, and then also later on in the continuous state and action spaces, we will not be able to do so because there can be some systematic error between the true state value 
and the approximated state will be. Right? Um, maybe a simple real world problem. So maybe if you have like three restaurants to your choice, and your question is to which restaurant do you should go, and you ask like three people, what is your, your state value of going to restaurant A, B, C? Uh, and they just approximate their answer because they may be uncertain about their answer, then there might be some wrong decision based on the recommendations of your friends because they may be unsure, they only approximate their answer. Okay. So what I wanted to highlight with this preliminary discussion is that um, although we will see in the, in the next couple of minutes today that many of these concepts which you have learned in the tabular case can be quite directly, conceptually integrated into deep reinforcement learning, that there are many challenges and that uh, many things which have worked very well for tabular methods can have practical problems, especially when it comes to optimality proofs in the context of deep reinforcement learning due to function approximation. Okay, so that is just that you should be cautious, although the equations which we will see in the following day look really nice, they really look familiar to you, that under the hood there might be technical problems when applying these algorithms then to deep reinforcement learning problems. Okay, but now let's start with this transfer from tabular methods to deep reinforcement learning methods, and the first transfer which we will do is gradient-based prediction. The gradient-based prediction is pretty simple. Um, basically, it's uh, very easy because in the tabular case, we have already learned about the incremental learning, right? So equation 9.5 should be very familiar for you. Let's say you have some target of the true state value function, so that could be replaced by a Monte Carlo target or TD target. And we had our tabular methods, and we just used the little step size alpha and exchanged our table values, right? And in the continuous state space, we basically do the same, but now the only difference is that our uh, cost function j is a differentiable cost function over the parameters w. So we therefore take the gradient of j with respect to w. So this will be then a vector depending on the size of w, and we update our parameter vector w with a step size alpha giving this gradient of the cost function. So, right, so we update not the table values now, but we update the function, like this blue function here, which is uh, describing the function of the state value estimates. But I hope that you can see the close relation between this incremental learning step and the gradient descent step on the unknown parameters w. So this is basically just a one-to-one -one mapping. Okay? Um, learning rate alpha, step size alpha is basically the same. Uh, needs to be tuned um, by hyperparameter tuning or just by good guesses. Question is now, how do we calculate this gradient? Um, the Standard approach would be the standard calculus, so the classical gradient descent on J. So what I mean with that is if we have some sampled state trajectories, x0, x1, x2, so over time we have obtained many data samples, then what we would do is we would feed this data samples here into our cost function and calculate the cost function over the entire data sample. That would be a full gradient calculation and basically try to find to the local minimum of our cost landscape. However, um, that might be computational burdenful because if you have visited many states over time, that means that your cost function needs to be also evaluated and the gradient of the cost function needs to be evaluated for many da data points. Uh, in supervised machine learning, that can make sense because your data set is fixed. But in reinforcement learning, as already mentioned, we have a, some kind of dynamic problem, right? So our policy can change over time because we want to learn how to make optimal decisions. So that means that states which we have visited in the past using an old policy which has been updated 
in the meantime, they will be not relevant anymore or not so relevant anymore because the policy in the past might be now much different to the policy which we use at the moment. So therefore, in reinforcement learning, it makes sense not to use the entire batch of information, but to use smaller batches. And the, in the extreme case, what we can do is the so-called stochastic gradient descent in its extreme variant. And that means that if we have visited a single state, xk, so a single data point, that we will calculate the gradient of the cost function just with respect to the single data point. So therefore, that would be not a full gradient, but the stochastic gradient based on a single data point. Advantage, of course, is here that we just need to calculate uh, v pi, v hat, and the gradient of v hat with respect to w just for the single data point and not for 10,000 data points or 100,000 data points. So this will be much quicker. And second advantage is, of course, especially if the policy pi changes over time, that we do not need to consider and reconsider and recalculate data points which have been already very old and might not be representative for our problem. If you use just a single data point, what normally will then be the problem? Of course, that will be, um, uh, will be prone to noise. So if there's like any noise on our signals and stuff like that, we maybe see that as, um, as shown here on the left hand side, that the stochastic gradient descent steps, they might be a little bit like uh, shaky and not so direct because the gradient is just approximated by a single data point or just by a few data points using a mini batch. But however, in expectation, so if we just take enough data points over time and apply the SGD steps in expectations, we will normally also able to find the local optimum of the cost function. So therefore, stochastic gradient descent normally is an uh, standard methods in order to reduce the computational burden also for reinforcement learning. Uh, programmatically, in terms of implementation, but you will see this in an um, example in the exercise, of course, what we could do is we can either calculate this by hand, right? So if v hat is a differentiable function, you can just calculate the gradient by pen and paper. But of course, nobody does that, especially for large artificial neural networks. So these gradient calculations will be then later done automatically using uh, automatic differentiation in programs like TensorFlow, PyTorch, JAX, and so on. So programs which basically do the numerical slash computational algorithmic differentiation for you. OK. Again, what I would like to highlight is that if you use stochastic gradient descent in such a convex, so this is a cartoonic representation of the um, isolines of a convex cost function, that will be fine, right? Because it will always converge to the local minimum. But if you have this global optimization problem, so if there's any non-linearity non in your problem, you might have multidimensionality because you have more than one parameter or one, more than one state, and also the problem is maybe non-stationary, then in this case, stochastic gradient descent normally does not deliver you good results. However, in practice, everyone does it, right? So if you use any reinforcement learning toolbox and also the codes, which you will write later on in the exercise, that is completely based on gradient descent methods or stochastic gradient descent methods. And I just want to highlight this again here with this little meme that this is actually really dumb. Because you know that you have a nonlinear, non-static, multidimensional problem. And in this case, stochastic gradient descent will always deliver you at best a local minimum depending on where you start. Right? And now consider that this problem space in terms of parameters W is not a one-dimensional problem space, but you have a deep artificial neural network with thousands or millions of parameters. So you have a thousand or million-wise problem space, which you initialize somehow randomly, and from there on you find the local minimum. So nobody tells you or can guarantee you that what you have found there is something close to the global optimum and be a good approximation of your value function or later on of your uh, controller function of your actions. So in that sense, we should be very cautious 
and evaluate the performance of a given prediction problem or of a given control problem very cautiously to find out if um, the reinforcement learning solution, which we came up with, if this is really fitting our needs or if there is maybe uh, problems with respect to local minima and so on. And the standard um, approach in order to come up with that is actually to do the learning not only once, but multiple times in that sense that we initialize our problem at many different initial values, omega zero, omega zero, and so on, and then try to basically find the local minimum just by reinitializing our problem, redoing the learning many times. We call this a multi-start approach, which is very common in reinforcement learning, that you try not to only fit one reinforcement learning agent, but let's say 10 or hundreds or thousands reinforcement learning agents, and basically try to find the best, the best agent uh, based on um, random initialization of your parameter weights. Which is a problem in that sense that in the tabular case, we had the policy improvement theorem and the policy improvement theorem set in simplified words, just do it once and if you iterate long enough, you will find accurate state value approximations or estimates and you will find an optimal policy, right? Now in this deep reinforcement learning problem, that is gone. Right? Even if you iterate long enough, you will not be able to find the global optimum for sure. And even if you restart your problem several times, reinitialize, redo the learning process, even then you have to be lucky. So that is a very big difference. Okay. But anyhow, I just want to highlight that. Um, we will still do it in this way because it's simple. It's easy to calculate, and in practice, it still delivers sufficiently well solutions. So therefore, we now do the gradient-based update. We basically already had this equation. So what does this equation mean? It basically means that our new parameter vector w at the time step k plus 1 is our old parameter vector plus now the gradient-based update. So the difference between our target and the estimate times the gradient here of the function approximator with respect to the unknown parameters. Um, however, this true target here, of course, is normally not known. We have noise or we have the learning process itself where we need to bootstrap. So therefore, later on, we need to take into account that we need to exchange this update target by Monte Carlo or by TD learning, and this will also have some uh, general impact, which we will see later on. However, now with this equation, which we have introduced here, I would like to come back to this generalization issue, which I have tried to sketch here just to make that clear again. So let's have a little example for this generalization problem. Um, here again, we have a linear function approximator. Two states, x1 and x2, with some feature engineering, which is basically just a bias here. And based on this, we have three parameters, w1, w2, and w3. Let's assume the initial parameters of this function approximator are 1, 1, 1. So these would be the parameters for uh, the parameter values for w1, w2, and w3. And let's say we visit the state pair 1, 1 for state 1 and state 2, which uh, is sampled as a true state value as 1, and we have a learning rate of 0.1. If we now do the math based on the previous equation, what we will see is then basically that our old parameter vector, 1, 1, 1, so this was the old parameter vector, is now updated. This point 0.1 is our step size. This one is the sample target value, for example, by Monte Carlo learning, doesn't matter here where that comes from. The estimated state value is actually three, because if you have the old parameter values, one, 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 and you multiply this by one, 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 your state value estimate would be a three. So the difference here is one minus three, so this is a minus two times point one. 
And here, this is the gradient with respect to the function approximation with respect to w. This is then 1, 1, 1 again. So basically, our new parameter vector after this update would be 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8. And if we visualize this in the um, state space, so this would be here, this grayish map would be the state value estimates of this linear function over the state x1 and the state x2 in the initial step. And this would be the state value estimate of x1 and x2 after the first step. And what we can see is now that although we have just sampled a state, which is roughly here, 1, 1, that not only the state value estimate at this point has been changed, but that this entire map, this entire linear surface, which we have set up here, has now changed, right? So the state value estimate is not only changed for the state 1, 1, but also for all other states, right? So this might be problematic in that sense that potentially in this region, let's suppose the state value estimates have been maybe quite correct. And now we have an update in a completely different region. And although in this region it might be correct, now we have again a shift also in this region back here, making it less accurate here, right? So that might be a problem due to generalization that I really need to keep track of my function form and my data distribution. Okay. But basically this is just another emphasis on this generalization problem which we have here on the blackboard. Maybe I'll go back. What we will do now in the following is we will utilize equation 9.7 and we will try to make out of this equation a real algorithm because the only thing which we now need to exchange is this v pi, right? So the true targets of the state value values, these are unknown and now these state value estimates or state values must be exchanged by target values which we can derive from data. The first approach in order to do so is the Monte Carlo target. This entire pseudocode should be already very familiar for you because that is exactly the same, or not exactly, but basically nearly the identical pseudocode for the Monte Carlo learning in the standard tabular methods. So we have an episodic kind of scheme where we obtain these experience tuples out of states, inputs, and rewards. And in the context of every visit MC, we can calculate the sampled return, right, at the end of the episode. And the sampled return is then used as the state value target, right? So this was v pi, and it's now exchanged by the sampled return in the Monte Carlo sense. Here was v pi, and we apply just a gradient descent step as seen on two slides before. And that's it. Therefore, the application of Monte Carlo learning for gradient-based gradient deep reinforcement learning prediction is very easy. The only step which we have to exchange is basically this last step where we not do the incremental learning based on a tabular method, but the gradient-based learning based on this function approximator, and that's it. So that's a very simple transfer. Uh, only thing, of course, which you need to consider in practical terms is you need good nonlinear feature engineering or potentially nonlinear feature engineering, and you need a differentiable function regarding the state value estimates. But in terms of the transfer from Monte Carlo tabular to Monte Carlo function approximation, that is very straightforward. Okay? Okay. That was easy, especially because this target here, the sample target of the return, of course, is independent of the function approximator itself, right? So if I calculate the gradient with respect to this sample return here, the sample return is independent of the gradient. However, if you now do bootstrapping, right? So if I do bootstrapping using temporal difference learning, the target v pi becomes 
dependent on the target estimate itself, right? TD0, we remember, V pi have been approximated by the first order temporal difference approximation. So we sample the return plus a discounted state value estimate of the successor state. And if you now calculate the gradient of the cost function based with this updated target, which is now based on bootstrapping based on temporal difference learning, actually, if you calculate the gradient, you would also need to calculate the gradient not only with respect to this V hat here at the end, which comes from the uh, quadratic cost function, but also with respect to this V hat here in the middle, which comes due to the bootstrapping, right? And technically, that's not a big deal, right? It's still a quadratic cost function. You can calculate this gradient. However, computationally, it will become a little bit more expensive because now you need to calculate the gradient with respect to V at the state xk and V with respect to the state xk plus 1. So basically, you would need to evaluate the gradient of this function two times per learning step. You can do that. Um, computationally, that is, that is possible. But in order to simplify things, what you can also do is semi-gradient bootstrapping or semi-gradient methods. So what does that mean is basically that this gradient here, this discounted gradient, so this gamma v hat xk plus 1 wk, that this gradient is basically ignored. And that's why we call it the semi-gradient, because we would basically ignore this part and still calculate the gradient just with respect to v hat here to the, with the argument of xk tilde. In this case, as mentioned, you need to uh, just calculate the gradient once and not twice. And the argument for that could be also here that especially for problems where the discount factor gamma is quite small, right? So a small gamma times this gradient here would be still a small gradient that in this case, especially for small gammas, this first part here of the gradient can be ignored without a big issue because it will be a small number. Okay, so semi-gradient methods, we basically ignore this part of the gradient here in order to uh, save us some calculation time. Do we then also ignore the sign of the second part or do we take the gradient of minus two? This one? The, the second part. No, the, the, the sign will be of course considered, right? So we will just ignore this part here and consider this part here. So there's the sign. <laughs> Good question. Um, so if we apply the same gradient, so we have this approximation, and as mentioned here, maybe I go back. So this part now is erased, and what we will find is only this um, nabla w minus v, which is here the minus, and here's a nabla w blah blah blah, and so on, right? So this would be then the gra semi gradient TD0 where the gradient here on the right-hand side of the equation is approximated in order to save computational time. So therefore, this equation 9.9 is, uh, is an approximated gradient of the cost function and not an accurate gradient of the cost function. If you then apply semi-gradient TD0 for uh, deep reinforcement learning prediction, the algorithm basically looks like the standard TD0 for incremental tabular learning. The only difference, again, is here this line where we now update not directly the state value of the tabular cells of our state value table, but we update the parameters of our function approximator using this semi gradient of the cost function. Okay? Same algorithm or conceptually the same algorithm, but we update the parameters of a function and not the table values directly. And of course, what we can also do, we can apply the same thing uh, in an identical way to the n-step TD approach, or now called n-step semi-gradient. The algorithm again is more or less the same as in the tabular case, 
The only difference, again, is just this line, basically, where we do the update based on the n-step target, now with respect to the parameter weights and not to the table values anymore. But the calculation here of the target, of the n-step target, is basically the same as on the tabular method. We just evaluate the function approximator here and not the table, uh, tabular values anymore. But I hope that from this little ride through Monte Carlo, through TD0 and now n-step TD, you see and recognize that the transfer from approximate TD learning and Monte Carlo learning into this uh, deep reinforcement learning domain is very straightforward given what we have already learned in the tabular methods. So we can transfer that conceptually one-to-one. -one. Only difference is instead of learning the state values of single tabular cells, we learn parameters of a function approximator, which comes with many challenges, as I said, generalization, nonlinearity, global optimums versus local optimums, and so on and so on. But conceptually, it is very similar. Yeah. Does the error we make then increase if our n step TD compared to zero step TD because we then ignore more gradients? Um, it always depends, right? Um, so, uh, as we have already discussed in n step tabular TD, we have seen that normally the parameter n, so how many steps you consider, uh, or also using eligibility traces in this backward view, which we have introduced as a variant of n step, um, that is basically a hyperparameter. So, given a certain problem, you can try to find the n steps or the eligibility trace backward view parameter, which basically fits best to your problem. Um, of course, the gradients here for the targets, they only apply to the parameter update itself. So, the target and n step is just uh, depending on v hat and not on the gradient. So, the, the gradient would be just calculated once and not n time for the n step td. Um, and therefore, the gradient problem is just here in this line, but not in the previous lines. Okay? Um, however, of course, the general problems which we have discussed today that the function approximator will deliver some errors is still uh, applicable here. Okay. Um, any further questions to this transfer from incremental tabular methods to gradient-based learning of state values? Seems not the case. Then I would like to extend that a little, not extend, but modify that a little bit to batch learning. So batch learning basically refers to the following. Uh, we assume that we have some limited but fixed data set D with certain state value targets from Monte Carlo, for example, or TD, some states which have been visited and actions and rewards and so on, which have been obtained. And the idea is now that we want to squeeze out as much as information of this limited data set as possible. Why is that important? Because if you have an experiment where the data is limited, because maybe the experiment is very expensive or you have just limited time to interact with this experiment, you want to get out the maximum extent of information as possible. Therefore, we consider this batch of data in the data set D as fixed and given and normally a rather small data set. The question is now, how can I get most of it out of this um, data set D? And we basically have two options. The first option is very simple, experience replay. We will discuss that on the next slide again. Uh, experience replay is actually a technique which we will see a lot during the deep reinforcement learning techniques. Um, this is basically just reapplying data points in a gradient descent manner. And the second one, which I would like to dig a little bit deeper into in the next couple of minutes, is the second part. And that is basically a special part if v hat is a linear function, because then we can basically perform least square solution in a closed form, which will be computational very efficient. 
But let's first start with experience replay. It is a very simple concept. Uh, I want to introduce it here to today in the prediction context, but we will also see that experience replay is a standard approach in all other reinforcement learning solutions. So what does experience replay basically mean? It is very simple, very straightforward. Given our limited data set D, what we will basically do is we will draw mini batches with one to B state value pairs or state value pair targets from the data set D. We call this a mini batch. And we will apply then this mini batch on our gradient or semi gradient, depending on what we apply, cost function. We'll do the update step and we will do this uh, potentially many times potentially also with a scheduling here of the learning rate alpha that we maybe start with quite high learning rates alpha and then schedule alpha to be going to towards zero such that we can reduce chattering of the parameters. And by doing that, we will basically grind the uh, data through our semi-gradient or full gradient calculation again and again and again until we basically find out that our parameters W do not change anymore over time. If we find out that after applying these mini batches in this experience replay amount so often that W does not change anymore between multiple update steps, that would give us an indication that we already have retrieved, have already milled out as much as information as possible from the data set. And this experience replay does especially make sense if your data set, as I said, is limited and you want to get out as much as information as possible. Um, yeah, usual tuning requirements apply, especially regarding alpha. And the target here, of course, would be approximated then by Monte Carlo and TD learning. So that's actually a trivial. Uh, I just want to define it here, what we define by experience replay. So experience replay means that we will reapply data points from a data set multiple times in a stochastic gradient descent manner in order to squeeze out more information. Okay, so that's simple. Uh, I think very intuitive. Uh, and we will leave it here. What I would like to discuss more in detail because I find this is a very elegant, especially for a simple task, and that is basically a least squares solution or an ordinary least square solution. The requirement for this is that our function approximator is linear. So we have a linear mapping. We have a linear mapping between our unknown parameters and the state vector or the lifted state vector using feature engineering. And we want to find this parameter vector using a fixed data set D. In this case, what we will basically have is we will have a classical ordinary least squares problem. I hope Wilhelm have introduced OLS last week, right? Least squares optimization for linear problems. Ah, yeah, he did. He definitely did. So it's very simple. Um, let's do it step by step. For TD, zero. For Monte Carlo, it's similar. For N step, TD is also similar. But for TD, zero, I find it the simplest. So what we do is we approximate our target by TD, zero. So the sampled reward plus the bootstrapped and discounted um, state value estimate of the successor state. And this estimate is now replaced by our linear function, right? So this is the same as here, just that we have defined the feature vector as a row vector and the parameter vector as a column vector, but that doesn't matter. It's a still a linear function. Now I can plug in this target in my quadratic cost function, right? So I plug this in here with my unknown v hat. And if I do this, I get basically this quadratic equation. In this quadratic equation, we can find out that the rewards 
are given, right? We sample the rewards from the plant system. So this is a known data point or data snippet. The states, state xk or lifted state xk and lifted state of the successor state xk plus one, these are also known quantities, right? So we visit the state, we sample the state, we save this information. So this is also known. And gamma, our discount factor, is also known, right? So this is known, this entire parenthesis is known. So the only thing which is unknown is here this omega again. So therefore, what we basically have is, we have a very simple least squares problem. So basically, the sum of some a minus b times w square a and b are these known quantities, a, b, and w is unknown. And in this case, we can basically just apply least squares optimization and can find a closed form solution for omega, uh, for w, not omega. How do we do that? We basically obtain data samples for air and for the states. That would be from the data set from our batch. So we have a mini batch with up to B samples of the rewards. We add up these data samples in a reward vector, which I have called here Y in the slides. In least squares, this is normally called the so-called target or dependent variable vector. And then we have a so-called regressor matrix or independent variable matrix, Xi. And what we do basically store here is the information about the state transitions, right? So this is basically uh, one row vector, this is a row vector, this is a row vector, and so on. So here we have stacked up many row vectors, basically forming a matrix with n elements per row and up to b rows. So basically this y and this xi are our data points just reordered based on the data buffer from which we have started with. Rewards and state transition information. And in this case, the least squares problem can be solved analytically. Um, if Wilhelm didn't mention this last week, you can just, you know, look it up at Wikipedia, it's super easy. Uh, and basically what we can find is that the ordinary least squares problem can be solved analytically as xi transpose times xi inverted times xi transpose times uh, y. So xi and y are just these data points, rewards and states, or lifted states, which can be plugged in here, and we find a closed form solution for our parameter w, which will minimize this quadratic cost function. And the nice thing is that this parameter vector w star the so-called TD solution, or also sometimes called the TD fixed point, that this solution now is a global optimum of our linear function, right? Because this is a quadratic function, quadratically depending on W, so that is therefore a local equal global optimum, which can be calculated very easily just by some matrix vector manipulations. You do not have to do any gradient descent. You do not have to do any analytical derivations and so on, or computational algebra algebraic equations. You just have to do a little bit of matrix and vector manipulations, and you get the best least square solution in terms of this linear function approximator W. And this is called then the LSTD, so the least squares temporal difference solution. The state value prediction is then very simple. If we have calculated W star, if you have any state or lifted state x tilde, you just multiply it here with W star and you get a state value estimate. Very simple. Uh, and in case there might be some numerical problems, so we see here that um, we need to calculate the inverse of the so-called product sum, psi transpose sum psi, that 
if there is a numerical problem, we can do a little bit of numerical regularization here, also called rich regression, where we would basically add this epsilon term here times the identity matrix in order to ensure that this matrix uh, is invertible. But this is only the case or is only required if this matrix psi transpose times psi would become a numerically unstable. Okay? So takeaway message here is if the problem is linear, we can calculate the solution in a closed form way using least squares approximation. And this can be done normally in no time if the data amount is limited. And we do not have any problem regarding uh, nonlinearity because this is a linear function approximation. However, uh, for real world applications, I would like to go one step further because uh, in the ordinary least squares approach, here we basically need to calculate the inverse of a matrix. That's a problem because inverting a matrix normally takes a lot of time, especially if the amount of feature vector variables, which you have called kappa here, is large. Then normally the numerical complexity, depending on what kind of algorithm you're using, could be up to O to the power of K, uh, kappa 3. That would be the standard Gaussian elimination, for example. So this can take time. This is especially the case if you consider that your data points might come in in a sequential way, right? So let's say you have a data set of 1,000 data points, and then you receive the next data point, so 1,001. If you would go in this calculation using ordinary least squares, that would mean that we need to calculate everything again from scratch. So you get here a little bit bigger matrix, and you need to calculate everything again. And for the 1,000 second data point, you needed to calculate it again with this big matrix inverse. So this would be computationally not efficient. Instead, what I would like to propose is if we apply uh, least squares TD on data points in a sequential kind of data stream, that we will use the so-called recursive least squares calculation, which is basically um, the same as ordinary least squares, but is applied in a recursive fashion uh, using uh, some linear approximation. Uh, here the nice thing is that every step of the recursive least squares estimation is just uh, basically quadratically computational complex depending on the number of features and can be applied in recursive fashion. The detailed derivation of the recursive least squares recipe, I will just give you the example, can be for example found in the book from Isemann and Münchhoff, Identification of Dynamic Systems. However, the equations are normally quite simple. Uh, I've called that the LRLSTD, so recursive least squares temporal difference learning. And what do we need to define here? We need to define our regressor vector, psi, k plus 1. So this would be our state transition of a data point. And y, that would be our update target vector using the uh, rewards. And then the recursive least squares update is straightforward. Here, this vector CK is basically our correction vector. W is our new parameter vector, and P is a so-called covariance matrix. So covariance matrix basically gives us an information how accurate our state value estimate is. If the um, condition of P is quite high, this basically gives us an information that the state value estimate is not as good as we would like to have it. The good thing here of this recursive least squares implementation is that this is basically an explicit algorithm, right? So in every step, we just need to plug in psi k plus 1 and y k plus 1 into our equation, and we can basically calculate them from top to bottom. This pk comes from the last iteration. This psi is a new data point, a new state transition. This lambda is a so-called forgetting factor. We will discuss that later on. This is hyperparameter. Here's again psi, p, psi. So this information is known. You just plug it in. Then you calculate c, the correcting vector. This is basically like an, something like the gradient pointing towards the direction where we want to update the parameters. y is a reward which we have sampled. This is y hat. So this is the difference between y and y hat times the correction factor, this is the update. So therefore, this can be also calculated online. 
And here the update of the covariance matrix can be also done online. So therefore, this is a very nice algorithm which can be implemented very easily and does not incorporate any matrix inverse calculation or something. Lambda, as I said, is a hyperparameter, the so-called uh, forgetting factor. The forgetting factor basically tells us um, if lambda is 1, that would basically mean that we will not forget information over time. If lambda is smaller than 1, that would mean that these parameter updates will be basically disregarded over time. So that basically means that data which has been processed longer in the past will be basically forgotten. That is an interesting concept for our reinforcement learning. Why is that? Because if the policy changes over time, then old data samples will be not as relevant as new data samples. So using this forgetting factor can be interesting in order to ensure that the updates are basically just due to data samples which are quite new. The implementation of this uh, recursively square STD algorithm is then also straightforward. Uh, we have basically just the update of the target, we have the update of the regressor vector, then the correcting vector, update of the parameter vector, and update of the um, covariance matrix, and that can be, as you've seen here, been implemented very easily using standard linear algebra tools. Therefore, in this implementation case, using a linear function approximator, you do not need any fancy uh, artificial neural network toolbox. So you don't need any TensorFlow, you don't need any PyTorch, or any kind of fancy uh, computational differentiation tool because this is basically based just on linear algebra and very simple linear algebra. So this implementation can be done straightforward. It can be done also in basic um, programming languages like C, C++. This can be done very easily also in real-time implementations using MATLAB Simulink and automatic C generation. So this would be the way to go if you want to do have a learning algorithm which is very simple and can be implemented in embedded systems, for example. However, there are some uh, remarks on this. So the covariance matrix P, I've already mentioned that, that can be inspected for an uncertainty uh, analysis. Small values in P suggest an accurate estimate. Large values in P suggest that we have still large uh, inaccuracies. Lambda is of the forgetting factor. I've already mentioned that for lambda equals 1, the LLS will converge to the normal OLS solution, and we do not forget something. If lambda is smaller than 1, typically still quite high, but smaller than 1, for example, between 0.95 and 0.99, these are typical values, uh, which we will find in practice very often, then uh, we will basically forget old data samples over time, which can be beneficial, as I said, for reinforcement learning. However, in some case, that might be numerically instable because we will basically increase the uncertainty of the estimate. In that sense, some re recursively squares regularization is maybe required. I have here recommended reading from Gunnarsson, which basically combines this rich regression with recursive least squares estimates. And what I've proposed here is basically the implementation of recursive least squares with temporal difference learning of zero order. However, we can also apply this in the same way to Monte Carlo learning or to n step TD uh, in the same way. Okay, that would be the summary already for today, which I normally do not go through. That would be more like for your uh, own learning and for your, for your homework, so to speak. Uh, what are the takeaway messages for today? The takeaway messages are that incremental learning from Monte Carlo and TD could be transferred to function approximation learning and deep reinforcement learning prediction easily. We have concentrated on on-policy learning. Off-policy learning has been not considered today. And we have seen that there are big differences between linear and nonlinear function approximation. Linear function approximation can be done in closed form using least square solution, and nonlinear function approximation normally requires more sophisticated implementation using computational differentiation like 
based on programs like TensorFlow and PyTorch. This was basically completely focused on predictions, so we have not considered how to make optimal decisions today. We have just considered the case, somebody gives you uh, a policy pi, and you want to estimate the value of this policy pi using data samples. And next week, we are then going to discuss how we can use function approximation also to find optimal decisions uh, when applying deep reinforcement learning. Any questions? Okay, then, thanks for your attendance for today.